So the next topic is actually just question and answers around OpenQA or about the community or about the developer process. I have not prepared anything, so um, I didn't expect the big, the big um, uh, hole, but anyway. Actually, I would like to, to, I have one question myself about this, um, and this is actually straight to Kulu, um, about the tool development process. Could you a little bit describe how you add your new features, how to fix bugs in the open, open QA community? And on the SUSE side, I can add myself, so. You want to start? Um, yeah, we have GitHub projects like um, o GitHub OS Auto Inst was, and uh, in that project we have, or in that organization as GitHub calls them, we have OS Auto Inst for the backend stuff. We have OpenQA for the web UI and the uh, user management stuff, and we have OS Auto in Distri OpenSUSE for the tests. And for OpenSUSE, we have also the needles there. It's called OS Auto in needles OpenSUSE. And for all of them, you can create pull requests, and we will uh, comment them and review them. And we have, um, for OpenQA specifically, we have running um, uh, unit tests on, on Travis that will report uh, regressions on the web UI itself. Okay, thank you. Are, are there many people outside of SUSE? How big is the OpenQA community? What, what would you say? Um, last time I checked, there were 40 contributors to all these repositories. Mostly the largest uh, contributions happen to the tests, obviously, because that's what the open source community interests most. Um, for open QA, we have. Huh? What? Yeah. Uh, use the microphone, please. <laughs> I don't. I think we have like two or three maximum uh, contributors externally to the code base. So the most most is done internally in SUSE. Okay. Mostly it's internally at SUSE, and we have uh, Fedora guys providing thick fixes they need. And uh, lately we have someone from Aachen who's contributing. Okay. Um, maybe Dominic wants to share a little bit about how they use it for tumbleweed and and leap. Yeah, I can give it a try. Um, of course, at Tumbleweed, we are heavily relying on OpenQA. For us, the important part is actually knowing what's happening and having a direct channel to the developers, which we do using IRC. And I think generally it works fine. People are reactive. Sometimes it blocks a snapshot because something broke. Last week, I think, we had something, but nothing that takes forever to get a fix in. Okay, I can share something how we use it actually for SUSE in production, for uh, testing the SLES version. We have actually two, two cycles of um, OpenK. First, we have the so-called staging project, where um, the developers can submit the packages into OBS, and then there is a kind of uh, an image where we that that we put together to do a staging process, where we, we set a, a use a bunch of um, tests to make sure that nothing breaks the image, and then this all goes in goes into the build server, and after a build is created for Slash, we um, do a full cycle of QA with a lot of different test cases in the in different areas, the functional, kernel, migration, and so on. That's how SLES is using, uh, how SUSE is using it for production QA. So um, are there any questions from anybody to the tool or to the development process? Anybody interested? Uh, okay, uh, you use some uh, uh, graphic library that can detect uh, can you road speak louder, please? Speak louder, please, I can hear you. 
uh, that can detect uh, rounds. Sorry? Move it, move it close to your mouth. Yeah. Close to your mouth. Okay, better. Uh, better now. You use uh, some graphic library that can detect road signs, and it, uh, when you have like uh, two pieces of text which are black and white, so high contrast, and the outline uh, has a few shades of grey, uh, different because of different hinting, you get 34 uh, percent match. How does that uh, like? It's pass the test. Pass the test, or what do you mean? Uh, I mean, no, it, it probably doesn't because it's low match, but actually the, uh, the text is very, very similar and the difference is only negligible uh, compared to the contrast of the whole image. So how, how does it... Uh, how, how, do, how, do, how do we do this? Okay, um, the, the, uh, there are two things. First of all, um, this percentage uh, depends on the, on the size of the needle. If you have a big screenshot, uh, then, then the percentage gets kind of blurry. If you if you narrow down the area and the needle is pretty small, then then you have more failures with the same issue. Uh, the other thing is we have we can change the percentage of where we of when a test case fails or passed. So we could say with 90% test case passes or fails. Is that correct, Kolo? Yeah. So, and so so we kind of. Um, have some some space here where we with a certain percentage it fails or passes and, and this these two rules have to be applied to every test case, to every needle and then make sure that the test case passes or fails. Yeah, Does of that course. Your question? And uh, there there is some guideline that uh, needles that uh, have uh, lower than ninety percent are completely useless because uh, I think that the, the percentage is fixed. We, it's with ninety percent or with something like this. Yeah, but what I am asking is how do you apply that algorithm that uh, detects road signs, which is like really fuzzy matching because you, the road signs can be rusty and uh, uh, the cameras are uh, blurry and uh, all that. And uh, uh, you get black and white text, which is high contrast, and you get a small outline only a few shades of gray different, and it's rejected. Yeah. Because we want to. This is how, it, how, how we want to it. Because there are um, screens, for example, where we, where we, where the underscore on the, on the text in the, in, the, in the UI element specifies the shortcut that you have to use. So you want to assert that if you press Alt F, the file menu opens. So you have to make sure that the F is actually underscored before you press it, which means there's a huge um, there's a huge difference if the F is underscore or the L, and that's why we have to make have to be very precise on the matching. And as Marita already mentioned, the needle can can be tuned to be forgiving. But um, as most of the times the product does not change its font randomly, this problem that I just outlined only happens if someone decides to change the font and then, then all the screens create this problem, but not in general. Okay. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, I have one. Um, you mentioned that um, OpenQA can automatically write bug reports. Is that correct? Can write what? Automatically write, raise bug, bug reports. No. No. Th no, that's not true. Um, actually, you have a test case and the test case fails or passes for different reasons. And then uh, the uh, and QA engineer has to to go in and investigate why this red case is, is red or green. One reason could be there is a new feature in the product and the test case has to be adjusted. One thing could be product has a bug, a failure, mm -hmm. and what, yeah, and something, yeah, or somebody broke the test case, somebody broke the backend, and so on. So there are two related issues or product related issues. And this is, has to be done manually, actually. The engineers have to check the red. Um, the red, the failing test case, 
and we have some methods here so that you can add, add a tag to this test case saying this is a bug and this is a product issue and then this has to be in investigated for so. But this is actually done manually. So, so, so in other words, you have a uh, change control board. Sorry? So. In other words, you have a change control board. You go through the results of the Yeah, tests. actually, we wouldn't say change control board, but it's actually the main work of product QA at the moment. So uh, we've, as a... Uh, at QA, uh, when we when we test less, we have this test automation framework. This is one part of our department's work, and the other part is really doing a review of the builds of the test cases. So we have implemented several groups who are doing a daily review or regularly review of the builds, mostly one build a day, and they really look into each um, red test case, make sure that we investigated it correctly and. Yeah, and, and also make sure that we don't have false positives and all this kind of stuff. This is actually the main, one of the two main jobs that we do at Product QA at the moment. Do you also test uh, GUIs like KDE? You also, do you also test GUIs like uh, KDE? Yes, we test the operation system, the installation and, and application stop, uh, on top like KDE and GNOME as well and, and other applications. And so how do you handle Things like when KDE crashes and Dr. Conky kicks in, how do you handle? I mean, if it's a if it's a KDE thing, we report a bug. If if it's if it happens occasionally, yeah, we kind of re-trigger the test cases, but make sure that we 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 track all this and 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 report bugs if it's really on the KDE side. Yeah. There's um, the tests have an, an, an post fail hook. So if they fail, they will try to gather some logs uh, to upload to the system so that it, that you don't have to rerun the test uh, manually, but have the logs right away uh, in the system that, so that we can provide the, the link to the failing test right, right to the developer and he has all the logs uh, available. And he has the crash dump there. The crash dump, not, in most cases not, but uh, other logs, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Any other things? What time is it actually? Uh, I have some other question with these uh, tests. I run in this uh, problem with different fonts as well. And uh, uh, could it, uh, when I uh, look at the uh, difference, uh, if I see that uh, there is no uh, significant uh, difference, could I uh, like um, create a difference uh, in the out uh, can, could I like um, subtract the outline from the area that is matched so that I get only the parts of the letters that are uh, fully um, yeah I mean uh, you can r narrow down the needle to the area that you're interested in and make sure that you really have com uh, needle and image comparison in this area and if you and you can exclude all the other stuff that you're not interested in. Does that answer? Was, was this a question? Yeah. Or, or. Uh, like uh, there, is, uh, there is text and uh, the difference is the outline because there is different hinting or diff uh, slightly different font. Maybe it may be, uh, if I like run a, dif a different terminal, it may be bold or... Uh, or oh, okay, if, if you have a change of the font, like it's bold or not, it, it really depends on this percentage. If the, if the percentage is, uh, is, is matching 90% or more, then you have a, a pass. If not, it's, it's failing. Well, it will not pass because the difference is too large, but I would like yes. to... Uh, I, will, I would like to comment um, what is available for investigation in the web UI currently. So what we do have available is the screenshot as it happened and the reference screenshot that he wants to compare with. And so what you, what you can do is you can take these two images and calculate the difference. Um, it, it, it's not done automatically because it's not such a common case um, to have a difference in, in hinting or like a little shadow or blurry edge around the fact that we would say we would need this more often in testing to help. Um, but I think it's quite easy and feasible to do because the data is available. And, and also what is reported is the 
is the um, this this value of match? Is it a zero percentage match? Like it could not try to match this anywhere or anywhere in between? Like as we as we saw in before, like a thirty percent match or sixty percent match, where we say like yeah, probably the right content is shown, but it differs, let's say in in the, in a single character or maybe the the, um, the, the, the hinting has been mentioned. Okay, thank you very much, Oliver. Any other questions from anybody? I have one question because I just saw on the slides, to my own surprise, that we have QA version 4.4. How, how, how do we plan this version numbers? I'm really surprised by this myself. <laughs> um, the 4.4, I think, was done two months before last year's OpenSUSE conference. And during the OpenSUSE conference, we dis discussed if we want to have 4.5, and we decided to wait for more features to be done. And then, so it's 4.4, and then a time... time okay, so my follow-up question here. Do, do you, we have something like a schedule for this? Does the community provide a schedule, or is it only an ongoing discussion on, on some daily stand-up meetings? And if not, is, would it be a good idea to implement something like this? More a formalized schedule for releasing or so? Possibly. <laughs> no, they, we don't have any schedule and we don't do any releases at this point because the, the main reason we did releases initially was because Fedora used the stable version that we provided and they don't do any, this any longer, so there is not any appealing reason to do releases at this point. Um, and Oli is moving more towards having a rolling release inside of Tumbleweed, so, um, but having increasing the version from time to time would make the message clearer that we're developing this thing and not that's not stale. But uh, other than that, I'm there's no roadmap. So, so the idea is more to, to move towards a rolling release, and this is already discussed in the in development team or under investigation. So currently what we have in the GitHub repository of our audience as well as OpenQA is, let's say, on a near daily basis, and new features added and uh, fixes merged. And um, all of this is in a releasable state because currently the tests that we run on each pull request is ensuring that the, the, the full uh, web UI can be started and tests can be triggered. On top of that, within, um, within OBS, where we, where we built packages for OpenSUSE and SLE, um, we, we are also uh, incrementing the version number, so it's 4.4 and then uh, some suffix to that. So each version number, of course, is unique. And what is um, currently done is that we have tests of OpenQA within OpenQA. So OpenQA is also testing itself. And the, the idea was to use the outcome of that in an automatic way to create a submission to OpenSUSE factory so that every release of that, if it passes its own test, will also be um, created as a submit request to provide a new version within OpenSUSE factory and therefore OpenSUSE tumbleweed and uh, and, and also we, we have it uh, in Leap, but then in Leap we are probably trying to um, come up with a more uh, stable way to releasing now. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Actually, if there are no other questions, um, I can recommend the test case beginner training for OpenQA, so is it the, some QA engineers will show you how to write test cases in OpenQA later today in, in, in the workshop area. I think it, at 4 o'clock or so, something like this, 4.45. Yeah, okay. Santi, do you have something else to add? No. Sorry? It, it's 4.30. Okay. So for 30, Santi and Matthias and Nick and Rodion sitting there with the nice t-shirts will do a test case beginner training if somebody is interested. Thank you very much.